following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good morning. I am Betty Pritt, and I would like to welcome each of you here in the sanctuary, listening on radio, and will be watching on the internet. This morning, I would like to speak on giving thanks. First, I have a little story I read. It says, two days, a man and his friend was walking through a field when they spotted an enraged bull. Immediately, they ran towards the nearest fence. The storming bull ran after them in hot pursuit, and they realized that they were not going to make it. Terrified, one man shouted to his friend, Say a prayer, John. We are in trouble. But John said, I've never prayed out loud before. I don't know what to say. But you have to, yelled his friend. The bull is catching up to us. Oh, all right, said John, as he ran with all of his might. I'll say the only prayer I know. My father used to say it at the table. Oh, Lord, for what we are about to receive, make us very thankful. Some people only pray when they are in trouble, and even fewer pray a prayer of thanksgiving. That is an interesting paradox in our culture. The more we have, the less thankful we are. The more we have, the more we want. The more we have, the more we are aware of the fact that we do not have everything. And if we should happen to forget about Thanksgiving, all you have to do is walk through the stores, listen to the media, and they will remind you. If you were not already aware that Thursday is Thanksgiving, you would completely miss it. But it seems like we have been totally bypassing Thanksgiving, moving straight from Halloween to Christmas. We go from a holiday of fear to one of hope without Thanksgiving in between. But the reality is that a grateful heart that moves us from fear to hope. Without Thanksgiving, we are not ready for Christmas. A grateful heart brings about an expectant heart. You cannot be hopeful about the future without being thankful for the past and grateful for the present. So you ask, how do we develop a thankful heart? I'm convinced that this is the work of God within us that only happens through prayer. We need to pray for three things. The first is we need to pray that God would move in our hearts from complaints to praise. Can you imagine how different the world would be if in the beginning people would never complain? The world would be a completely different place. But now, can you imagine how different we would be today if we would stop complaining? There would be a whole new us. A new joy would begin to take over and have everything to say. If we would just stop complaining, our relationships would be different. Our jobs would be different. Our homes would be different. And right here at St. Paul's, 
our church would be different. Well, I read that there was a pastor who had a sign on his wall that read, whining. But over that word was a circle with a slash through it. He wanted his office to be a no whining zone. Then you'd think maybe if you saw it, been there, heard that. So what we need to do is to change our hearts from whining to gratitude. We need to be thankful for what we do have. We need to keep repeating, no whining, no whining, in the hope that one day the message may get through to us. But somehow, whining seems to be the siren heard throughout our culture. Here we are with more luxuries, more food, more things, more of everything than anyone else in this world, or in the world's history for that matter. Yet, whining seems to be the language of our culture. But one of the things that so impressed me is whenever I see anything about the other countries. It seems that when you see them, the Christians there, they're so joyful. They live in abject poverty, often not having enough to eat or the basics necessary for life. But still, they are full of praise for God. Their worship is exuberant and joyful in the overwhelming deprivation. But so often here in the United States, where our problem is having too much to eat and too many things to buy, we are focusing on what is wrong rather than the blessings that overflow from our lives. I want to give you an idea for a little experiment. Let's just do it on Thanksgiving Day. As your guests arrive and that, announce that not a single word of complaining can come from anyone's lips. And then we'll see how difficult it is. See how accustomed we have become to looking at the negative instead of the positives in life? Hear what Scripture says. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like the stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. And you can read that in Philippians 2, verses 14 to 16. So having a heart that has developed a spirit in our lives in an unbelieving world if we are as negative and cynical as the rest of the world, or worse, what does that say to those who are watching us? Do you think that they would want to become a Christian? But constantly on our lips should be words of praise. We ought to sing about the words of Scripture that says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth belong to you. 
Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are the exalted head over all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise in your glorious name. And then the second thing is that we need to pray that God will move our hearts from criticism to encouragement. Haven't we been beaten enough, beaten up enough in our world? Do we need to be beaten up by our friends and even at home as well? Should not our Christian family be the place where we find understanding and encouragement? We really need to be careful of the things that we say to each other. The Bible says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom we are sealed for the day of redemption. We need to get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. You think that that was written just today, but you'll find it in Ephesians 4, 29, 32. The command of God is that we build up another. Never tear another one down because it grieves the Holy Spirit when our words hurt instead of heal. Again in scripture it says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice in the Lord forever. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near, from Philippians 4, 4 to 5. We need to work very hard at being gentle towards others, especially husbands and wives, and to our children, but to all the people in our family. We need to build each other up looking for that positive that you can praise instead of the negative that we are tempted to criticize. Always look for ways to encourage. And when Paul reminded them that the Lord was near, he wanted them to know how quickly life can come to an end. If we died this moment, what would be the last words your loved ones would remember coming from your lips? I think back to the thousands of people who died on September the 11th. Those who had cell phones called their families to say that they loved them. It was the most important thing that they could say. They wanted their last words to be the words their loved ones remembered. But yet I'm sure that there are many of the people who died who did not have a chance to call home before their life ended. We have to wonder how many had just exchanged angry words the night before. So you must be kind and compassionate to one another, 
forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you, Scripture tells us. We need to ask God to help to move our us from criticism to encouragement. And then the third thing that we must learn is that we need to pray that God will open our hearts from cynicism to faith. All of us have questions. We learn by questioning things. But there is a difference between questioning something and expecting that there is a reasonable answer and questioning for the sake of just questioning, not expecting anyone to give us an answer. We can question because we want to know. Or we can question as an excuse for not wanting to know. A skeptic is a person who doubts something is true, but yet is willing to investigate the facts in order to know whether it's true or not. A cynic is one who assumes something is not true and is not willing to look at the evidence or take it seriously. I've known people, as I'm sure that you have, who are stuck in life because they have allowed a cynical spirit to grow in their hearts. Any time that we might present the truth of Christ to them, they always want to ask a question. And before we could even complete the answer, they ask another question. And then another. Their conversations might be like, yes, but, or what about this? And other people believe. Some people question because we are on a journey to discover the truth. The cynic isn't even interested in the journey because they assume that all roads lead to nowhere. The problem with a cynical spirit is that you never get anywhere. It's like rocking in a rocking chair. It robs you of confidence in life. The cynic asks, how can we know that there is a God? How can you be sure that there is a heaven? Or how do you know that you're a Christian? But yet the message of the Bible is that God wants us to have confidence and know some things for sure through faith. John wrote, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you, each one of us, have eternal life. Jesus was constantly confronted by cynics who sudden, suddenly, stubbornly refused to believe. They were willful in their spiritual blindness. Even though he had performed miracle after miracle before their own eyes, he said to them, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And that comes from John chapter 10, verse 38. Another time when Jesus told a crippled man 
that his sins were forgiven. The cynics accused him of blasphemy, since God alone could forgive sins. But he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which would be easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. From Mark 2, 8, 11. A cynical heart can never be a grateful heart. It lives in the quagmire of doubt. It is never willing to crawl out of the darkness in order to come to the light. There is nothing to be grateful for because everything is questioned. There's even a smirk on their face instead of a smile. Faith is not something that just comes over you. It's a decision, a decision that we make. There are not some who are predisposed to have faith, and there are some who are disposed, predisposed to doubt. All of us have that choice. We must decide to have faith. But this is not just a blind faith with no evidence. There is evidence all around us, from the sunsets to the babies to the animals. In the Bible, it says, what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. And for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities has eternal power and divine nature. They have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuses. I have seen some people, and I'm sure that you have also, that in the midst of staggering adversity, I have seen others that abandon their faith at the first sign of trouble. That is a choice that we have to make. But the one thing is for sure, an unbelieving heart cannot be a grateful heart. The old saying goes, pity the poor atheist who sees a beautiful sunset and yet has no one to thank. We are those who, even if we have nothing, still have someone to think that will never leave us. We keep thinking that everything has to be taken care of and all of our needs met before we can be thankful. One of the most amazing stories of the Bible is the God's deliverance of Israel from the slavery of Egypt and how he delivered them to the promised land. Miracles accompanied them throughout their journey and God's presence was audible to everyone. So how did the people respond? Were they grateful? for all that God had done for them? Well, when we read in the Bible, it says, then they despised the pleasant land. 
they did not believe his promise. They grumbled in their tents and did not obey God. They did not believe God's promises after all he had done for them. And therefore, they become cynical and could not find a place for gratitude in their hearts. And as I was doing this message, I come across this. I'd never heard of it before. It's called the 30 Years of War. And it was a series of European conflicts lasting from 1618 to 1648, involving most of the countries of Western Europe who fought mainly in Germany. It was one of the worst in history when it came to the number of deaths, when it came to the actual economic upheaval and the ensuing epidemics that killed as many people as the military conflicts did. A pastor named Martin Wincart buried 6,000 people in a single year from the plague, about 15 a day including his wife and children. It was a very dark and difficult time, only during the first and last year of his ministry did he have peace. He went through some of the most horrific times that a person could ever experience. But yet, if you look in the hymnals, you'll find that in the middle of that time, he wrote a hymn of praise. And some of the lines go like this. Now thank we, our God, with hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things have done, in whom this world rejoices. For those who move from complaints to praise, from criticism to encouragement, and from cynicism to faith, we have the reward of joy. For those of us who ask God to change the negative spirit within us, the Lord will give that gift of praise even in the worst of circumstances. Amen. And many of you know that I never close without offering the prayer of salvation because we must have a personal relationship with Jesus. You can find that prayer in Romans chapter 10 starting at verse 9. You want to share it with those you love and those that God loves because we don't want to be in heaven and those others somewhere else. So please look that up in your Bible. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful that even though we criticize and whine that we try to be better. We just ask that you'd have the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, that there will be no room for those words, that we will help others to find the peace of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. We brought the story of our The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.